looking into the book of Luke, article 41, verse 41. Here we have Jesus speaking. It's being recorded that Jesus said these words. Suppose ye that I have come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division. So there's a lot of voices out there in the world, right? A lot of voices out there screaming, peace on earth. Let's have peace on earth. Let's work together. Let's work in the government system to create a peace on earth. But Jesus said to us what? He hasn't come here to send peace on earth, but a division. And if you look into, into the world right now, if you look at earth right now and the different divisions that are going on, divisions of countries, right? Well, China and Russia and America and Canada and Japan. These are our divisions of countries, right? And within these countries, there's cities and, and territories. And on these territories, what do we see happening? There's no peace there, right? There, there's crime transpiring. There's drug abuse transpiring. There's alcoholism happening. There's families that are being torn apart. There's people who are having accidents in their vehicles. There's people who are breaking their bones. There's war in, in between Russia and Ukraine. There's no peace on earth. And we catch sicknesses and diseases. And these things that we wrestle with and fight with in our flesh, what? They take away our peace, right? They try to steal our peace. When we're diagnosed with cancer or heart congestion or a liver failure and our flesh is, is failing, and dying. There's no peace. There's no peace in the flesh. So Jesus was right when he said that, don't think that I've come to bring peace on earth. I haven't. I've come to bring division. Division. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 23, the Bible says that I will put a division, this is the Lord speaking, through Moses. I will put a division between my people and thy people. So God is saying that there's going to be a division a division between his people and the people of the world, right? And the people who live in the world. And, and what's the division? What's the difference between his people and the people who are in the world? Well, his people have come into the kingdom. They've been born again. As Jesus said, unless you're born again of water and spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom and you cannot see the kingdom. Well, those who have been born again are in God's kingdom. And they're part of God's kingdom. And there's a division there. There's a space there. And the world can't come into this kingdom. And the world can't touch this kingdom. And the world can't experience this kingdom. There's a, a great divide there. But you know what we find in this kingdom? You know what we find in God's kingdom? We find peace. We find a peace in God's kingdom. And, and Jesus told us that there'd be no peace on earth but he said we could have peace in his kingdom. If we entered into his kingdom here on earth, we could find peace. And, and that peace flows through the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Ghost. Right? One of, the, one of the fruit of the Spirit is called peace. Right? So God gives us peace in our spirit. And, and, and that peace that we have in our spirit, what? It, it, it then resides on earth. But it's not coming from earth. And there's no peace on earth, but we're carrying God's peace. We're, we're carrying the Lord's peace inside of us through the power of the Spirit. So the world's looking for peace, right? Individuals are looking for peace. Some take drugs, some take alcohol, some go to the doctor, they get antidepressants because they have no peace inside of themselves. They have no rest. And they're looking for something to help them to find that peace. Well, the Lord said that, he would give you the peace, and He would give you the rest. How? If you come into His kingdom. If you take up His invitation to come and follow Him and lay down your life and give up your life and give up your will for the will of His kingdom, then within that kingdom you will find a peace, a peace that you can carry on earth. If we were to talk honestly, one-on-one -on -one together, right? and examine ourselves. Well, what do we find? What will we find? Well, within me, right, I have love. I can express love. 
but I also can express hate. And with, within me, I can express joy and laughter, but I can also ex express bitterness and sorrow. And, and within me, I can do kind deeds and kind, kind actions, but I, I can also be selfish, right? I can also be selfish. So within inside of every human being, there's a dual nature in operation, a nature that has a dual capacity. Now, now Buddha taught us that that capacity was the yin and yang, right? And, and other religions teach us that, that this dual nature that we see in operation, it's okay, no problem, it's okay, it's there. And the evolutionists will say, well, it, it developed over time, and, and we just have to accept it, and we just have to embrace it, that's the way we are. Some voices out there in the world go so far as saying that, well, you need to have both in order to understand both. If you never experience hate, then how will you ever know what love is? If you never experience sorrow, how will you ever know what joy is? So there's many voices and, and many, many reasons and many excuses and many philosophies against this nature or, or at this nature that we see in operation within human beings. And a lot of these voices are, are trying to tell us as human beings, as individuals, to just accept this fact. Just accept this fact, because it's there and we see it in operation, and, and don't worry about it, and don't think of too much about it. But yet our society is, is full of murder, right? And our societies are full of thievery, right? And our societies are full of abuse, right? People getting drunk and, and, and hurting one another, and people on drugs and killing one another and shooting one another. So th this nature that's inside of us as human beings... This nature that, that has the capacity to hate and, and be jealous and, and murder and envious, right? As it expresses itself in the world, right? It's doing damage to the world, right? It's taking away the peace from the world, right? This nature as it flows, as it flows through human beings, right? It, it's causing harm to the world, right? And anyone who would sit back and, and listen to what I'm saying here could agree with me and say, well, if we didn't have that... that that side of our nature that was bitter, and if we didn't have that side of our nature that was angry, and if we didn't have that side of our nature that gets jealous, then our world and our cities and our societies and our families would be quite different, right? Because we, we wouldn't see these works in operation. We wouldn't see these evil deeds playing out all around us and affecting us as a human race. So no, no matter how much you want to dress it up, right? No matter how much you want to look to it and say, well, no, we need it, and we just have to accept it, and it's there, and we have to live with it. The truth about it is what? That it's actually harming. It's harming us. It's harming the human race. It's destroying the human race. These expressions of the nature that's inside of us that cause us to do evil to one another, it's destroying our societies. It's destroying our families. And it's not something that is good. It is not good. So just stay here with me for a little second and, and just listen to me here for a little second. You know, many of us believe in a heaven, right? Many of us believe in, in, in a better place once, once we die. We look to the world and we see all that's transpired in the world and, and a lot of us, if we're not uh, under the power of philosophy or under the power of evolution, then somewhere in our heart of hearts we say, well, I hope there's a heaven and I hope there's a good place once I pass away because this would be a shame if this is all that there is. Because in this life I've experienced some, a lot of heartaches and, and a lot of suffering and I've gone through a lot of things and I would hate to think that this is all that there is to life. So in our heart of hearts, again, we, we, we think that there's a heaven. All right, so let's talk about that heaven. Let, let's talk about that great place, that good place, right? And, and in, the, in that place that we imagine and that we think of, right, we see it as a wonderful place, a place of love, a place of peace, a place of goodness. Well, Oh, what if I die tonight? What if I die tonight with, with, with my, my nature inside of me? That, that nature that, that loves but also hates. And that nature that has joy but is also bitter. And that nature that can be jealous and envious and, and hurt my brother and hurt my sister and hurt another species of the human race here on earth. Oh, what if I died? You think that nature is going to get up into heaven? You think that nature is going to get up into the good place, as, as you would see it, that good place? Well, well, if that nature was allowed to get up into that good place, right, well, wouldn't that good place become tainted? 
if heaven's a perfect place and, and I get up there w with my nature that I have inside of me that, that has the capacity to, to kill and, and murder, well, eventually, right, that nature is going to express itself up there in heaven. And it's going to taint heaven. And heaven's not, no longer going to be a place uh, of love and, and completeness and goodness and kindness. It's going to be tainted by what? By that nature that I brought up there. So, so it doesn't matter what, what we think, right? If we die, unless somehow, some way, that nature gets changed, unless somehow, some way, that nature gets de dealt with, then if we, we, if we analyze it and we just logically think about it, then what? Then, then if that nature was allowed up into the good place, if that nature was allowed up in, into the heavens, then that nature would destroy the heavens just like it's destroying the earth. Just like it's destroying the earth. So now we're left with a conundrum, right? Now, now we're kind of left with a problem because we have to admit, well, look, I may not be such a bad person, but yeah, okay, I understand. I've got a dual nature, a, a double capacity here where I can love and hate. And, and yes, if I die, I'm going to die with that nature. And if there's a good place and I bring, and I bring that, that nature with me up into that good place, I'm going to taint that good place. I'm going to be the cause of the destruction of that good place because I'm going to bring my bitterness up there and I'm going to bring my anger up there and I'm going to bring my jealousy up there. So that's why scripture teaches us, you know what? That n nothing evil is going to ever enter up there. Nothing evil will ever, ever enter up there. So a, a logical thought comes to people's minds to say, well, you know, I do good deeds too. And, and hopefully I do enough good deeds in order to get up to heaven. And they rationalize it. You know, I'll try and do good, more good deeds than I do bad deeds. But that doesn't work. Because even if you do more good deeds than you do bad deeds, it doesn't change the fact that your nature remains. And the capacity to do evil remains. And if that capacity is allowed up into heaven, then eventually it will affect heaven. And the view I'm putting forth here, and what I'm talking about here, is what Jesus talked about. And what Scripture shows us, the Holy Bible teaches us about this nature. So there's, again, I said there's many voices out there, right, that, that speak about this nature. And, and Buddha's voice will say, it's okay, it's no problem, embrace this nature. And the evolutionist voice will say, yeah, well, that's just the way it is, so embrace it. But here we have Jesus Christ, the one who claimed to be God in the flesh. The only one who ever claimed to be God in the flesh. And, and here he is teaching us what? That there's a major problem going on within us. That there's something, something not right that's going on within us. And, and, and this operation of this nature in us, it's not even our fault. We, we didn't ask to be born with it, right? We didn't ask to have a nature in us that's bitter and, and, and envious and jealous and, and gets angry and lusts and wars and fights. We, we were born into this world and we were stuck with this nature. We had this nature in us. Well, the Bible teaches us that this nature came into us because of Adam and Eve. The Bible says that Adam and Eve were created perfect. They didn't have the capacity to, to, to be angry. They didn't have the capacity to, to get upset. They didn't have the capacity be, to be jealous. All that side of that nature only came in after they fell in the garden. After they ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree, right? And that fruit was their what? So, so God wouldn't have robots. That fruit was put in the garden so man would have a choice and not be forced to serve God. God said, here, I give you everything. I ask you one thing. Don't touch of this fruit. Don't touch of this fruit. So there was a choice given to man. And thank God, God always gives us a choice. God never overrides our will. From the beginning of creation of man until now, 2022, God always gives you a choice. And one of the most powerful things that you have inside of yourself is your will, your will to choose. But Adam and Eve were in the garden before the fall, right? And they knew what peace was. And they knew what love was. And they knew what goodness was. And they had never experienced uh, the opposite to that, right? But they still knew what love was. So that voice that's out there saying that, well, you need the bad in order to understand the good, that's anti-scriptural. That's anti-biblical. That's not what the kingdom of the Lord says. So now, yes, it's, it's used as, as a schoolmaster to us. Now it's teaching us, this nature inside of us, it teaches us. But, but before this nature came into man, we didn't need it. We didn't have to have it in order to know love. We didn't have to know hate in order to know love. We didn't have to know sorrow in order to know joy. 
Adam and Eve knew joy, knew joy and knew love without ever having experienced the opposite. If you take scripture at face value, right? If you look at scripture and you take scripture at face value, then what it's saying to us is that that part of our nature, that nature that's debased, the one that hates, the one that, that the, the side of us that operates under jealousy and, and confusion and lust and anger, that, that was given to us not from the Lord. That came into us as an as inheritance from Satan. You know, we talk about we inherit things from our parents, right? We inherit things from our parents in their will. Well, when, Satan, when Adam and Eve fell, Satan became the ruler of this world. And, and Adam and Eve were, were, was put underneath this master. And this master gave us an inheritance. And the inheritance that he gave us was the capacity to sin, the ability to sin. Now, what we call a dual nature, what we've, what we've been told is a dual nature, the, the lying and the stealing and the hate, it, it's, God calls it a sin. He calls it a sin. Why? Well, there's many reasons why he calls it a sin, but the scripture says that because it's against his law. Because God doesn't want us to lie. And, and God doesn't want us to hate. And God doesn't want us to be bitter. Why? Because he knows that when we operate through these emotions and through these feelings that nothing good gets accomplished. That when we hate our brother, we hurt our brother. When we're jealous against our brother, we hurt our brother. And, and when we start hurting one another, to God, that's a sin. The greatest commandment is what? Love one another, right? Or, or well, second greatest commandment. Love one another. Love God first, love one another. Love thy neighbor as yourself. Yet, this nature inside of us doesn't allow us to do that. It doesn't. Oh, but I love. Yeah, you love, but you hate. Oh, but I have joy. Yeah, you have joy, but you have bitterness and jealousy and anger. And, and, when, we, and when we perform those deeds, and when we, when we act through that side of the nature that we're carrying inside of us, to, to be jealous, to be hurtful, to be envious, to be lustful, then, then we're actually creating sin. We're actually partaking of sin. And, and remember I said to you that that nature can't get up into heaven. That nature can't get up into the good place. Why? Because the good place would cease being the good place. If that nature was allowed up there, then it would taint that place. Well, here the Lord is saying, well, this in, in His eyes, this is sin. And, and I can't allow this sin up in heaven. And I can't allow you to come up in heaven with sin. So now we're really stuck. We're really stuck. If we take Jesus at his word, then we're stuck. Why? Because we have this nature inside of us that's causing us to sin. It is causing us to sin. And that's the law of consciousness, right? And we've all experienced it, right? Well, what do I mean? When you've done something that you knew was wrong, before you did that act, before you took the act, and did the wrong deed. Your conscience spoke to you. And, and something inside of your conscience spoke to you and said, don't do it. But you use your own will to continue to do it. See, the Bible teaches us that we have a conscience and it's the, it's the law of God speaking to us. And it says, don't do the wrong when you're about to do the wrong. That's what scripture says. It's his law in operation in us. But the power to perform the good, the power to do the good, we lack. E even if... We, we overcome temptation in our flesh and we become disciplined and we've only stolen once and we've only told five lies in our life. That doesn't matter. Because by doing that deed one time, right, then we've broken the law of God. But in regards to the fact of how many times we do it, that's not the, the issue here. The issue here is that the capacity resides and rests and dwells within us. And it's the capacity that we have to deal with it's a capacity that has to be dealt with. And Jesus Christ came to deal with that. Jesus Christ came to pay the price for those sins. Well, what do I mean? Well, when you do wrong, right? If you're in a car and you're driving 80 in a 50 kilometer zone and the police catch you and give you a ticket and then you decide to go to court and fight and it's your court date and you go up to the court and you're in there now and the judge is before you and you say, Judge, yeah, okay, well, listen, I, I know I was doing 80 in the 50 that day, but I, there's many times that I'm on the highway. I've driven a thousand times. I've driven a thousand times, and 
I've always stayed in the speed limit. I've never gone over the speed limit. So because I've done that a thousand times, always followed the speed limit, I want you to dismiss this ticket right now on my behalf. I want you to take away the punishment. I want you to take away the consequence to those actions. What would the judge say to you? The judge is going to practically laugh at you, right? He's going to say, okay, sir, I understand that, you know, you've kept the speed limit, but listen, you still were caught breaking the law. And because you broke the law, a punishment is required. So you have to be punished. You have to be fined. So, so pleading to the judge, right, that you've done good deeds and pleading to the judge that, that you followed the law 90% of the time or 95% of the time, it doesn't get you out of that, right? It doesn't cover you, right? It doesn't excuse you, right? And it's the same thing in the kingdom of God. For those who hope to, to, to stand before the Lord or, or to, get to, that good, to get to the good place, to the heaven, whatever it may be in your concept right now, you, you can't get up there and say, well, listen, I, I've done a thousand good deeds and only five bad deeds. That's not the problem. What's the problem? Those five bad deeds, they came from a nature. They came from a nature that caused you to do those bad deeds. And, and first, the Bible says, because you did those bad deeds, now there's a judgment upon that. Now you must be judged. Why? Because you broke the law of God. And everyone who breaks the law of God must be judged. So from scriptural point of view, we have a nature in us, right? And it's pushing us to sin. And, and what we would call sin and what we would call evil, it's stemming from the side of us that, that hates and lusts and has jealousy and envy and anger and bitterness. And every time we take a step, or every time we take a decision, or every time we use our will and we give in to that side of us, then we're sinning, we're doing wrong, we're breaking God's law, we're breaking God's commandment. And all this is, if you will say, recorded. All this is written down in the heavens. And all this is within us. So we carry it in us. We carry our sins in us. And it gets dangerous. The more we sin, the more dangerous it gets. Well, what do I mean? Well, you can steal something, right, one time, and, and you, you get a conviction. The law of God operates within your consciousness, and you're convicted, and you don't do it again. Or you can do it a second time, or a third time, and then you never do it again. But, but you do it a fourth time, and a fifth time, and a sixth time, and guess what? Now that conscience is, is seared. Now, now that law of God that's in operation in mankind is seared, and it's, it's, it's broken. It's not functioning properly anymore. Why? Because you choose not to listen to it. Because you, you chose not to, not to follow it and not to give heed to it. And, and you seared it. You shut it off. And, and, and the next time that you're stealing, someone steps in your way. So you pull out a 9 millimeter and you pop him. Pow, pow, pow. And you take his life. The, the more you play with sin, the more dangerous it gets. Nobody wakes up. Nobody's born. No, as a little child, and say, I'm going to be a murderer. I'm going to carry a Glock in my, in my side. And if someone messes with me, I'm going to pull out that Glock and take his life because you de I demand respect. Because you got to respect me. No, it's playing in sin and touching in sin. And that nature of sin having its way with you. Because that's what it's doing. It's having its way with you. You think you're in control of your life. You, you think you're the one that's in control of yourself. You're not. The only control mechanism that you have in your life is your will. Is your will to say yes or no. But, but your emotions and your feelings, you don't control them. They come to you. And they come to you to push you, to motivate you, to do things, right? So when you're angry and you're bitter and, 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 and you're feeling that you should do some things, well, that's trying to lead you to do what? To sin, to do wrong. Why? Because by doing those deeds and giving into that, what? You make the world a place of no peace. You make the world and the society and, and where you live a bad place. A bad place. So we're all stuck under the judgment of God according to Scripture. None of us escaped this. The only one who was born without sin, without that sin nature, was Jesus Christ. That's the only one. Apart from Adam and Eve after they fell, the only other man who's ever had a sinless nature was Jesus Christ. So we're all walking under the judgment of God, right? All of us die tonight, and I'm going to stick from the point of view of, of a Christian point of view, from a scriptural point of view. You die tonight, and you stand before the Lord in judgment. There's nothing you can say to convince Him to let you to go into heaven. 
There's nothing you can say. There's nothing you can point to. There's nothing you can explain to the Lord to say, let me into heaven. Why? He's going to say, I can't. Why? Because that nature inside of you. If I let you in here, if I let you come through these pearly gates, then you're going to taint my kingdom. And, and that's not going to happen. Never. Never going to happen. But, but God so loved the world, right? Scripture says that he gave his only begotten son. And many of us like to quote that scripture, right? God so loved the world. God, God, God loves us as individuals. And, and the judgment that was supposed to fall upon me and you for those evil deeds, because of that sin nature, Jesus took that judgment. Many of us don't understand what, what that means. But sin has always been covered. Sin has always been covered by blood. From the, old, from the Old Testament times to the New Testament times, it takes blood to remit sin. And in the time of Israel, before Jesus, they sacrificed once a year to cover the sins of the people. To cover them. Not to take them away, but to cover them. And they rolled over to the next year. And they rolled over to the next year. And every year, blood had to be sacrificed in order to cover the sins of the people. Why? Because the people were sinning. Why? Because that nature that lives inside of them pushes them to sin, pushes them to break God's law. But Jesus came as the final sacrifice for us. Scripture says that he, he shed his blood once and for all. So rather now than, than the blood of animals being spilled year after year, Jesus spilled his blood for us to cover our sins. To cover our sins. So yeah, when we stand before him, right? Uh, on that last day when we take our last breath and, and we go before him and, and we have that, that, that nature in us and we've done the wrong. And, and there's nothing we can say to the Lord. Yes, I've done wrong, Lord. You know what the Lord says? That's okay. I paid the price for you. That's okay. I covered you. My blood covered you. My sacrifice covered you. Scripture says we are buried with him through baptism, right? We bury our old man with Christ through baptism. We bury that sinful nature. We bury those deeds with Christ. Does it mean we become perfect? Does it mean that sin is eradicated from our flesh? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. But what does it mean? It means that the judgment that should have fell upon us now falls upon Christ. And Christ allows us into his kingdom and he gives us a new and glorified body. A body that's untainted with sin. A body that's, that, that doesn't have that sin nature in it anymore. In that, in, in that operation. We, we all know scripture teaches about, you know, we're going to receive a glorified body when we get on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. But within that glorified body, there's no more sin nature there. There's no more capacity to hate. There's no more capacity be, to be jealous. There's no more capacity to murder. And, and, and what got us up into that kingdom? Our good deeds? No. Our good deeds didn't get us up into that kingdom. But the sacrifice of Jesus did. Yes, God, I know I did wrong. Yes, I lied. Yes, I cheated. Yes, I stole. And depending how bad you've been in your life, yes, you've murdered. Yeah, yes, you've hurt. But, but you paid the price for me, Jesus, because you love me. You shed your blood and you died on the cross. I should have died because of these sins. It's not my fault. When you strip it down, really, it's not your fault. You know, we take responsibility because we have to take responsibility. But I didn't ask to be born with this nature in me. I didn't come into this world and at five years old say, I want this dual nature in me that I'm going to wrestle with. That's going to try to get me to do wrong. That's going to try and get me to sin. That's going to try and express itself through me. So what? So I hurt those around me and I hurt my society and I hurt my world. And my world becomes filled with addiction and depression and suicidals and murders and envyings and lusts. None of us said that, but that's what we got because of the inheritance that we were given. But we don't have to stay with that inheritance. Jesus made a way for us. He paid the price for us. So he covers our sins. And he says, yeah, you know, you're worthy of judgment, but I paid the price. I died for you. And, and you see how serious it is? Whether you believe in the story of the Lord or not, people are, oh, it's just a story, it's just a story. It's not just a story. This is, the, this is truth. And, and it cost Jesus his life in the flesh. We hear about the story, a crown of thorns on his head, right? And, and suffering on, on the cross and being uh, pierced with a spear, right? And being mocked and spit upon and slapped and beaten. That that was the price he had to pay to cover my sin and to cover your sin. But he did it. Why? Because he loves us. But just because he did it and just because he loves us, it doesn't mean that we're covered. 
It doesn't mean that we, we, we automatically get a get out of jail free card. No. Jesus said we had to be born again, right? In order to enter into his kingdom. In order to see his kingdom. So even though Jesus paid the price for us to cover our sins and to make a way for us to get into eternity and, and to get to that good place, to get into the heavens, to be with him forever, we still have things we have to do. There's still things that we have to do. You can believe on the story of Jesus Christ. You can accept on the, of the story of Jesus Christ. You can believe that he died on the cross. You can believe that he shed his blood. You can believe that you are carrying a sinful nature that he wants to cover with his blood. You can believe all that. But that still doesn't get you into the kingdom of God, right? The sacrifice of Jesus doesn't lead you into the kingdom of God. Believing on the sacrifice of Jesus doesn't lead you into the kingdom of God. Jesus said you have to be born again to see and to get into, king, into the kingdom of God. So all of us are under that commandment. All of us are under those instructions from the Lord. You must be born again to see and to enter into my kingdom. Yeah, yeah, but Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross. I, I believe that you shed your blood for me. Great, you believe that. But that's not being born again. Accepting and believing what Jesus did is not being born again. I would contend here that there's one way to be born again. There's one way to enter into the kingdom of God. And scripture shows us, if we read the book of Acts, and we see the altar calls that are given to the lost, and we see the invitations that are given to the lost to come into the kingdom of God, it's very clear what they did, right? There was repentance that needed to happen. Well, first there had to be acceptance and belief. Then there had to be repentance that would happen. Then there had to be baptism. Then there had to be infilling of the Holy Ghost. To be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. And we see that the evidence of getting the Holy Ghost is speaking in another tongue. Why? Well, you can wrestle with that in the book of Acts. And, and you can try and wrestle with that in the book of Acts. But Paul lays it to rest. Why? Because Paul clearly teaches in Corinthians. What? When the whole church comes together. When all the believers come together to hold church service to the house of the Lord, right? They're all speaking with tongues, all of them. And tongues are for a sign to the unbeliever. Well, it's very clear then. When you're born again, you get filled with the Holy Ghost and you speak in tongues. Or else how could the whole church body come together and how could all of them be speaking in tongues? So I'll contend and I'll wrestle with you tonight that you can't call yourself being born, you can't call yourself born again. You can't walk around and say you've been born again if you haven't had new birth experience according to scripture. If you say that, well, I believe in Jesus and I placed my faith in Jesus and I'm born again. No, no, that's not correct. Faith doesn't save you. Faith is not the saving element. You can have as much faith as you want. You can have the, the greatest amount, amount of faith that any person has ever had and that still will not save you. Why? Because James says faith without works is dead, right? And I'm not talking about good deeds. I'm not talking about going around and doing good deeds now, those type of works. But you can have all the faith that you want, right? But that's not going to save you. What's going to save you? Obedience. Obedience to what Christ requires of you. Obedience to what Christ commanded you to do. That's what saves us, right? Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name? And Lord, Lord, have I not cast devils out in your name? And Jesus said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. And that's a touchy subject. And that, that touches the heart of some people. Why? Because what's saving them is their faith in Jesus. When you strip it down and you analyze the heart and you see the belief system that's going on in the mind and in the heart of the person, what's actually saying? They'll, they'll say, well, Jesus saved me. And they'll talk about Jesus. But when you strip it down, what's saving them is their faith and their belief and their trust that they put in Jesus that they put in Jesus or on Jesus. That's what's saving them. But faith is, faith is not the saving element. Obedience is the saving element. Faith leads you to take the actions. Faith pushes you in the bum to go forward and do the actions that Jesus is asking you to do and to submit to the Lord. But faith in itself doesn't save you. It's obedience to Scripture, obedience to the commands. If you love me, keep my commandments, right? This is how we know the love of God. What? That you keep my commandments. 
and they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do what things? Walk in the flesh. Live after the flesh. So there's a whole bunch of doing in Scripture. From the, from the first part of the New Testament to the last part of the New Testament, there's a whole bunch of doing that is placed on the back of the believer. A bag of doing is given to the believer. Here's a bag. Here's a back sack. And when you open the zipper and you look inside, you know what it's full of? It's full of things you have to do. It's full of things you have to do. And we see it in Acts 2.37. What? Well, that's the first altar call ever given in New Testament times. Whether you want to wrestle with other scriptures and, and try to draw your conclusion from other scriptures, let's look to what actually transpired, right? A church service went on. Peter was holding the church service. He was the pastor at the time. And he was talking to a bunch of unbelievers. And he preached Christ to them. And he preached Christ crucified. And he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he was done preaching, the people who were listening to him, the Bible clearly says that they believed and they accepted on Jesus. But the question they asked Peter is, what do I have to do? See, they knew they had to do something. They knew they had to obey something. And I'll say it again, new birth experience has all these elements in it. It doesn't matter in what order these elements come, come out, but it has all these elements in it, which is having faith and belief in Christ, repenting, being baptized, and being infilled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence, the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, if you want to sit here and contend and wrestle and fight with me and say, no, as soon as I accept and I believe I have the Holy Ghost, then you're outside of Scripture. And you're outside of scriptural teachings. Because that's not what scripture teaches. Because those men on the day of Pentecost, they accepted and, be and they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But they were not automatically sealed with the Holy Ghost. They were not. Peter told them, repent, get baptized, and then, and only then, will you receive the Holy Ghost. Now, other teachers out there in the world, they're going to try to twist this around and twist that around and... and and take away from the point and say, well, well, he, th those were just those people were being told they have to be uh, baptized and, and have to receive the Holy Ghost. Well, you're, you're missing the point, right? Peter is saying that they didn't have the Holy Ghost. They did not have the Holy Ghost. But yet they accepted and believed. So there's no way now you can ever tell me that once I accept and believe, I have the Holy Spirit. Because I see just the opposite in Scripture. And then again with Paul, right? When he finds those disciples of John. And have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Well, they believed in Jesus. They believed and they accepted on Jesus, but they hadn't received the Holy Ghost. And then Paul pinpoints it. He says, well, unto what then were you baptized? Well, how were you baptized? Why isn't the Holy Ghost here? And they say, well, I was baptized unto John's baptism for repentance. So you see, they already had the element of repentance in them. Why? Because they got that through the baptism of John. John was preaching repentance, right? And here we find a group of believers that have already experienced their repentance, right? But they haven't been baptized correctly. And, and Paul tells them, you've got to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they submit and they get baptized. And the Holy Ghost comes on them. And they speak with other tongues. So all the elements to the plan of salvation, to being born again, as what Jesus described in John. And again, we lay it all out. How? We see it in Paul. When Paul says the whole, all the church comes together, all the individual members of the body of Christ come together, and they're all speaking with tongues. Well, the only way they can all be speaking with tongues is that the, when each and every one of them receive the Holy Ghost, then they receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence, which is speaking with another tongue. And remember, Paul said that that tongue is for a sign to the unbeliever to know which is the true church. Okay, so I gave you a little refresher on that for a reason. Because scripture also teaches us that we're fighting our flesh. We're fighting this sinful nature. Yes, it's, the judgment has been paid for through Jesus, right? We understand that. The shedding of blood, the shedding of Jesus' blood has paid the consequence, has paid the judgment, has paid the price. But it doesn't mean that this sinful nature now it just goes away. Poof! The magic, it disappeared. No. Scripture tells us what? That, that this flesh now, this nature now, is going to fight against the Spirit. And the Spirit's going to fight against, against the flesh. And the flesh is going to still want to rule us. And the flesh is still going to want to cause us to walk 
in, in that nature and express those desires and, and live through that nature. But now after having received the Holy Ghost, being filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps us to overcome the flesh. The Holy Spirit rises us up above the flesh in order that we don't have to fulfill those deeds, in order that we don't have to live down in, the, in those low places anymore. So it's essential and it's ne necessary to be infilled with the Holy Ghost. Because if you're not infilled with the Holy Ghost, then you cannot overcome the flesh. And Scripture says that if you don't overcome the flesh, and if you don't overcome these sinful deeds, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, yeah, but, but Jesus died for me. You even you said he paid the price for me and, and he shed his blood for me. Yes, he did, absolutely. He, he paid the price and he shed his blood to cover your sin. That's right. But he doesn't want you to stay in sin. And he doesn't want you to continue to walk in sin. And he's given you some do's to do in order not to stay in sin. And if you continue in sin, and if you allow sin to rule over you, then you will be lost forever. You will not get into, into the pearly gates. You will not make it home with the Lord. Jesus said, Paul said, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God if you do such things. Not you, can, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God, but Jesus covered you. That's not what it's saying. It's teaching us that if you live like this, and if you do these things after having been born again, and after having been filled with the Holy Ghost, then you disqualify yourself from the kingdom of God. Why? Because you allow that nature to continue to, continue to rule and operate in you. So God has given us the key. God has given us the key to shut off that nature, to shut off those actions. So once you're born again, and once you're spirit filled, you have a clean slate, right? You have a clean slate. All that you did before, all those wrongs and those sins that you've done, that you did before you were baptized and you buried yourself with Christ, they're all buried now with Him. No more to be remembered. Jesus doesn't, doesn't hold them to your charge anymore. His blood covers them. But now you have the rest of your life going forward. And now you have to keep walking until God calls you out of this world, till you take your last breath. And do you think what, now once you're born again, you can just keep on sinning and keep touching the unclean thing? And keep loving the world and then call yourself a friend of god no it's not going to work you're not you're, you're not going to make it you're good you're, you're being deceived that's that's not the kingdom of the lord the kingdom of the lord says now you're now you're born again right now you've entered into the kingdom now jesus said you're like a little child now you've become like a little child and you need to learn and know and grow in the kingdom and part of that growing in the kingdom is what is learning how to walk in the Spirit. But you can't walk in the Spirit if you've never received the Spirit. You can't live and walk in the Spirit and be led of the Spirit if you've never received the Spirit, according to Scripture. If, if some church doctrine has picked your pocket, if some church teaching has picked your pocket and, and told you, well, as soon as you believe and accept it on Jesus, you got the Spirit. As soon as you invited Jesus into your heart, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. Then this man... This church body has picked your pocket because that's not in accordance with Scripture. Anywhere you see a person coming out of the world and being born again, again, it has all the elements, all the elements that I shared with you. And, and once you experience the new, the new birth, yes, then the Holy Ghost is inside of you. And yes, then it, it wants to give you power and it wants to give you strength. What? So you don't sin anymore. So you don't sin anymore. You don't live after the flesh. You don't walk after the flesh. The flesh doesn't rule you. Sin doesn't rule you. But now the Spirit of the Lord rules you. And instead of, of being bitter and angry and upset and hatred and jealousy and lust, you have the opposite. You have the fruit of the Spirit abiding in you and living in you and moving in you. And that's where you're walking and that's where you're living. And when you fall, because again, this is a fight, and, and no one wins the fight without being hit, right? No one wins the fight without falling down. No one wins the fight without, with, without some opposition. So our opposition is what? I sin. And I've made a mistake. And I've done wrong. Well, the wonderful thing about that is now, well, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Why? Because my grace covers you. And my blood covers you. And, and pick yourself back up. And, and get back in that fight. And, and get back on that road. 
but but it's not a perpetual place of sin that we live in it's not a perpetual place of, of evil that we live in if you're living in a perpetual place of sin and doing wrong and desiring wrong then you're not being led of the holy ghost you're being led of the flesh or you're being led by a demon but you're not being led of the holy ghost within living for god within walking and living for god yes of course you're going to make mistakes and, and and even more so when you're a child when you just come into the kingdom right anyone who's have who who have had children they understand this concept your child's growing up and they're learning and they're learning everything for the first time and they make a lot of mistakes right and you don't crucify them for their mistakes and, and, and you don't punish them for their mistakes you teach them out of love what's the right thing to do and, and what's the wrong thing to do and that's how Christ is with us in the spirit but it's his will for it's his will for all of us what to overcome the flesh to overcome the flesh and overcome these deeds and overcome that nature going to church doesn't mean you're in the kingdom of God fellowshipping with people in a church doesn't mean you're in the kingdom of God listening to someone teach from the Bible doesn't mean that you're in the kingdom of God praying doesn't mean that you're in the kingdom of God worshiping and singing songs does not mean that you're in the kingdom of God giving money to the to a church body does not mean that you're in the kingdom of God the only way to get into the kingdom of God is to be born again the only way to get into the kingdom of God is to be born again of spirit and water that's the only way and unless you do that you can't see the kingdom and unless you do that you can't enter into the kingdom and so you're stuck in the flesh if you're not in the kingdom of God then you're stuck in the kingdom of the flesh you're stuck in the kingdom of the world where there's no peace and no joy and no love only small expressions of it right oh, oh only temporal expressions of it for a season for a time there's 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 goodness for a season for a time there's happiness and then what happens well that other side takes on over right trial life, a trial of life a tribulation of life something comes your way storms are blowing because that's what life is that's what life is about because this world is in a fallen state and the nature that's ruling this world is doing evil upon the world through mankind 